Hebrews chapter 9, and let me read verses 25 through 28 again. Nor yet that he, Christ, should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall they appear the second time without sin unto salvation. We discussed these verses last time, how that Christ was superior to the priesthood of the Levites, particularly in verses 25 and 26. And as a sacrifice himself, verse 26, he was superior to the bulls and the lambs that were all also offered uh, on the altar by the Levites. And because he is infinitely greater than those things, uh, his death on the cross for sinners only needed to be offered once when he did it. Uh, he is eternal, and the, the eternal benefits which flow from his sacrifice still come to the sinner 2,000 years later. Thank the Lord for that. And it doesn't need to be repeated. If it did need to be repeated, it would be no better than the animals that were offered preceding it, than the animals before it. Um, verse 27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, soul winners often recite this verse, or quote this verse, to press upon the sinner the urgency of salvation. Don't put, off, don't put it off now because you don't know when you're going to die. Never put off till tomorrow what you want to do today. Paul writes, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2. And Christians should remind uh, an unbeliever of that fact. But let me discuss something else about verse 27. It states that it is appointed unto men once to die. And most believers would cite this verse to oppose the idea of reincarnation. That's the idea that after you die, you may come back in another form or as another person. And from time to time, you'll hear these crazy testimonials that I have a strange sense, this strange idea that I once lived before. I was a great prince in Egypt, or I was a king in China. Or I, they always, they were always somebody royal, right? They were never a janitor, right? They, were, they never tell you, well, I remember cleaning toilets back in the 1930s during the Depression, and then I was born, uh, reborn in the 1970s, and uh, now, I'm, you know, now I'm a bus driver. I mean, you never hear those stories. It's always, I was someone royal, I was someone important, in, which makes you suspicious whether what's really going on in their mind. But, um, and most Christians, uh, however, would not be able to go beyond that verse in their uh, objection to reincarnation. And that would help the, that something that, that, Hindus and Buddhists believe in. They believe in reincarnation, that uh, through good karma or bad karma, that is doing good deeds or doing bad deeds, you will either come back as a higher form in this uh, ascending hierarchy of life forms, or you will come back as a lower form in a descending order. If you were bad in this life, you were, you were uh, corrupt, you mistreated others, and you generally went through life with a negative outlook, you may come back as a lower form, a lower animal species. And I guess the highest level of animal species is a cow, a domestic animal, a cow which is just about to come back in the next life as a man. That is the ascending order in their, in their chain of uh, souls. I asked a guy once, doesn't that mean that the, he, was a, he said he was a Hindu, I said, doesn't that mean that the cow must also be a Hindu. <laughs> Evidently, the cow is trying to do its best in order to come back as a man in the next life. You, you have to assume the cow believes that stuff too, right? 
I don't think he'd ever thought it through. But how do you know you're going to come back as a cow in India when they protect you? <laughs> you may come back as a cow in Oklahoma. And next thing you know, your breakfast for some farmer there. Your breakfast for some Baptist that goes to church. And <laughs> you have no... See, Hinduism is, is, is limited to a certain locale, a certain geography. One of our missionaries, Brother Mark Farnham, uh, Farnham rather, uh, he'll tell you that true Hinduism is restricted. You, you can only be born a Hindu into a Hindu family. It's not something that you proselyte, they proselyte, or rather proselytize, and someone can join Hinduism. That's sort of a Western uh, American uh, hope that I can join their religion. Their religion is exclusive only to those who live in that part of the world and are born into that life. And that is a true a devotee of Hinduism. And Buddhists also believe in reincarnation. Uh, and most Christians, however, couldn't argue beyond that one verse. And the Hindu or the Buddhist could argue against them quite successfully. I'll give you a couple of verses that they could use. Go back to the book of Galatians, chapter 6. Galatians 6. And I'll call your attention to one verse there. We use it quite a bit. Galatians 6, verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And from that, that one verse alone, a Buddhist or a Hindu would try to say, well, you see, good karma brings back good fruit. Bad karma would produce bad fruit. And uh, you do good in this life, and uh, good will come to you in the next life. We may come back in a, in a higher form. Uh, or, a bad, or a lower form, depending on your actions. But the verse has nothing to do with you coming back in another life. Look at the context. Back at um, verse 5. For every man shall bear his own burden. Uh, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. That's here and now. Uh, verse 8, for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. That's here and now. If you are a, a pack-a-day or a two-pack-a-day smoker, don't be surprised if you get sick and emphysema one day. That's in this life. If you're a heavy drinker, don't be surprised if you have medical uh, problems because of that. Verse 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing. That's here and now. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Verse 10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. That's right here and now, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So he has not, he's not talking about some hypothetical in a future life or coming back as a, another form. He's talking about practical day-to-day -day living right here, right now. And uh, go back, if you will. So, so a, a text without its context can be used as a pretext to try and argue for something. That's what the Catholic Church does with Matthew 16, verse 18. Uh, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And they say, and they extrapolate from that, that Jesus was making Simon Peter the first pope. And I thought I debunked that a week or so ago in my sermon. And if I didn't, go back and watch it and, um, and consider what I said. John chapter 9, go to John chapter 9. John and chapter 9, start there at verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And the disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin? This man? Well, it had, would have had to have been in a previous life. Or his parents, before he was born, that he should be born blind. See, and so a, a, a reincarnationist would try to extrapolate from that, that in a previous life, he had sinned, and this was bad karma coming back to haunt him. Or his parents had sinned before he was born, and this was punishment coming to them because of it. See how people can use the verses and twist them? But look at the very next verse, verse 3. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents. He didn't even entertain the idea that in a previous life, this guy sinned, and he's coming back. Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I 
must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. So he's saying that I might be glorified. Was this, that's the purpose this man was born blind. That the work of God through me might be made manifest. Everything is intended to serve Jesus Christ. Bear that in mind. The whole universe was made by him and the whole universe is going to bow down to him one day. Everything is intended to glorify and magnify and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, ultimately. So Christ doesn't even entertain a cockamamie idea like reincarnation, nor was it even asked by the disciples. But someone might want to twist it and mean that, you know, God knew in advance that this man was going to be a sinner, so he struck him with blindness before the fact. But they didn't ask anything about a previous life or some such previous existence. And um, along with Hebrews 9, 27, there are some other verses that all also ought to be uh, referred to. Go back to the book of Job, Job chapter 7. Job chapter 7, Job 7, and notice there verses 8 through 10. The eye of him that hath seen me shall see me no more. Thine eyes are upon me, and I am not. As the cloud is consumed and vanisheth away, so he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him any more. Look over at Job chapter 10. Job 10, verse 21. He says, Before I go, whence I shall not return, even to the land of darkness and the shadow of death. Job chapter 16. Job 16, verse 22. When a few years are come, then I shall go the way whence I shall not return. And Job chapter 20, Job 20, and again there are verses 6 through 9. He's speaking of a rich man, though his excellency mount up to the heavens, and his head reach unto the clouds, yet he shall perish forever like his own dung. Well, that's not very flattering, is it? <laughs> What's brown and sounds like a bell? Dung. They which have seen him shall say, Where is he? He shall fly away as a dream, and shall not be found. Yea, he shall be chased away as a vision of the night. The eye also which saw him shall see him no more, neither shall his place uh, any more behold him. The Bible does not teach reincarnation. In fact, uh, it's contrary to it. But that's not what Christ meant when he said he must be born again. <laughs> he didn't mean that. But Hebrews 9, verse 27 states a general truth. It is appointed unto men once to die. Everyone knows that they're going to die someday. They try to avoid it. They try to postpone it. They try to pretend like it's going to happen to everyone else, but not to them. And we joke about it, and I look around, and I see everybody getting older, and I look at myself in the mirror, and I'm getting younger. <laughs> of course, you're just lying to yourself. But we all know we're going to die one day. We don't know exactly when. We don't know the precise uh, time or the exact circumstances. But we know it's going to happen. And only a fool would lie to himself and say it's not going to happen. Um... And, but there are some in the scriptures who died, were brought back to life, and eventually died again. I'll give you a list. Of, I, I thought of about eight examples in the scriptures, and if there are more, then um, I, I'll be willing to add that to the list. But first of all, the widow's son, 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah raised to life again. Then there was the Shunammite, the husband and wife's son, in 2 Kings 4, who Elisha brought back to life. He was the disciple of Elijah, succeeded him. Then there was the dead man. You recall, this one gets overlooked, but 2 Kings 13, 
after Elisha was dead, uh, the Israelites are taking a man to bury him, and they lower him into the same sepulcher, the place where Elisha's body had been buried years before. And this man's body touches the bones of Elisha, and he comes back to life again. That one gets forgotten many times. There was Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue's 12-year-old daughter, who Christ healed, Mark chapter 5. The widow of Nain's son, Luke 7, who wasn't a little boy, must have been a young man, perhaps a teenage uh, young man. They're carrying him in procession to the graveyard, and the cart, or the beer, B-I-E-R, which means a, a conveyor, some, some conveyance, some cart, or something they roll the dead on, they're taking that to the graveyard, and Christ comes and touches the, the bier and says, I say unto the young man, arise, and the young man comes back to life again, restored to his mother, but undoubtedly died a second time. There was Lazarus, the most well-known, John chapter 11, after he had been dead and buried four days, Christ called him forth back to life again. There was Tabitha, also called Dorcas, Acts chapter 9, who Simon Peter raised back to life. And then Eutychus, a young man who fell to his death because Paul was long-winded preaching and he fell asleep during the sermon and died in Acts chapter 20, who Paul brought back to life. Those are at least eight, and if there are others, uh, let me know if you can think of them. Enoch, Genesis 5, verse 24, never died. The Bible says, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Look forward at Hebrews 11, and verse 5. Hebrews 11, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. I heard a guy preach a, a, a good sermon, to make a good sermon point, that in the Bible, translate always goes from something inferior to something superior. It's not an equal transfer from like one language to another. So when we're talking about translations, over time, the translations became better and better until you get to 1611 and the King's English, the King James Bible, is translated uh, and it set the standard. All others want to be like it because there's no way to improve on it. They are hoping that its, its power, its shadow, will fall upon their later version and some of its glory will rest upon their product. But it never does. That's why they have to keep updating it about every five years. A new version comes out. And so when they say a translation is not perfect, are you kidding me? In the Bible, the word translate always refers to something that went from bad to better. Your body's going to be translated to be glorified like Jesus Christ. Enoch was translated from this life to a better life in heaven with God. And um, Enoch was a type or a picture of a New Testament church-age believer who lives to see the rapture of the saints. I hope it happens today. Uh, you and I would then be among that number who live to see the catching away of the saints to go be with Jesus Christ. Look back for just a moment at John chapter 11. John 11. And when Jesus goes to the grave of Lazarus, Martha, verse 24 says, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. Now notice, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Amen. That's a picture of any Christian who's died before now. He was a believer, he trusted Christ as a Savior, but he or she have already died. They've already, we've already had funerals for them, they're already in heaven now. Their bodies have been buried or disposed of in some way. Uh, that is a Christian picture of a Christian who dies before the rapture. Look at verse 26. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's a picture of you and I if the rapture happens now. 
Those who live to see the rapture. Two, two groups of Christians are included in those two verses. Christians who have died up to this point, and those of us who are still living, uh, or who, are, who will still be living when the rapture takes place. The two groups of Christians are pictured there. And um, Enoch was a picture of a believer who lives to see the rapture, and he never dies. He simply goes up to be with God and is translated into a better form. Mm -hmm. Moses died once, and he was buried, according to Deuteronomy 34, verses 5 and 6, and uh, Jude, verse 9, 120 years old was Moses when he died and was buried. But he appears alive unto the disciples in Matthew 17, the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, Christ was transfigured before him. They saw his uh, appearance as bright as the noonday, as the sun, and Moses and Elijah both talking with him. And Peter said, let us build here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elijah, uh, which indicate the time when that event took place, when the, the Feast of Tabernacles, once a year the Jews would build a, a lean-to, a little small um, hut, so to speak, at, outdoors, and they would live outdoors, outside their homes for a week to observe that feast, and to recall the way they lived when their ancestors wandered in the wilderness. And that was the Feast of Tabernacles, and Peter said, let's build three, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, which indicates the, the time of the year when that event took place. That's in the, roughly the month of September. Um, but Moses will come back in the tribulation, Revelation 11, as one of two witnesses, and end up dying again. So he died, will be resurrected, and die again, and then be resurrected again. That's a lot to go through. <laughs> but Moses is a picture of a tribulation saint who dies in the tribulation at the hands of the Antichrist and then comes back again in the, at the second advent and ends up dying a second time in the millennium. And there's also another, that was Elijah, who I mentioned a moment ago. He was caught up to heaven alive, just as Enoch was in 2 Kings chapter 2. You can read about that and his uh, followers saw, stood on the dist, off in the distance, one side of the Jordan River, and Elijah and Elisha crossed over to the other side, the other river bank, and from a distance they could see a, a fiery chariot come out of heaven and catches up Elijah and takes him up to heaven, and the prayer shawl, or the mantle, fell to the ground, and Elisha picks it up, and says, where is now the Lord God of Elijah? And he strikes it into the Jordan River, and the waters part. And Elisha crosses back across to where all of their disciples and other men were watching and following. And he went in the spirit and the power of Elijah after that. And someone... Um, he said uh, to Elijah, Elijah asked, what wilt thou? And he said, let a double portion of thy spirit rest upon me. And Elijah said, if thou seest me when I go up, it shall be unto thee. And he witnessed his master, Elijah, being taken up by a whirlwind and a fiery chariot into heaven. And, um, and I confess, I didn't go through and count them all, but Someone said that Elisha actually had twice as many miracles to his credit as Elijah did. The final one being that dead body that was lowered onto his bones and then came back to life. So Elisha performed twice as many miracles during his ministry as Elijah had done. And um, like I say, I didn't go through and count them. You might do that at your leisure and uh, see if that's not so or not. But Elijah represents tribulation saints who live, they go through the tribulation and come into the millennium in their bodies to eventually die in the millennium. You say, why are they going to die in the millennium? Because they're going into their millennium in these human bodies. These bodies as they are now, they're not made to live forever. 
Um, go back, however, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 65. <coughs> There's some things I have a grasp on, and some things I don't have a firm grasp on. Either I haven't spent the time studying that specific topic, or maybe there aren't any solid answers available yet. <clears throat> but Isaiah 65, and I'll come back to that thought in a moment. Isaiah 65, he mentions a new heaven and a new earth, verse 17. But he also mentions... The time, verse 19, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. That's Israel. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old. But the sinner, being an hundred years old, shall be accursed. So men are going to die in the millennium because they are still in fleshly bodies. However, uh, someone will be considered still an infant or juvenile at a hundred years old. This will be the way of reckoning the age of men. And so if they die even as a, a child at a hundred years old, then it stands to reason that people older than that will also die. Exactly where their souls go and how they are comforted by God, if that should happen, I'm not the right one to answer that, at least not at the moment. If I come up with an answer through further study this coming week, I'll certainly return to it try to answer that. Maybe you've read something that I haven't read. If so, by all means, let me know, and we'll see if that doesn't square with the, the Bible. But let's read verses 27 and 28 again, here in Hebrews 9. You know, the mark of someone, uh, a mark of rather uh, humility is being able to admit you don't know everything, and you're not an expert on everything. Dr. Ruckman would have been the first to tell you, after having read through the Bible 150 times, he said, nobody knows everything. He, he, he wrote his commentaries on the Minor Prophets. He years took years before he ever decided to. And someone asked him, years, why have you written, or written commentaries on them? He says, I don't understand them all yet. He wrote commentaries. That doesn't mean he understood every particular, every specific. But for the benefit of those who were um, listening to his preaching and trusting his preaching, he wrote commentaries all the same. But he would have been the first one to say, no man can exhaust the Bible. No man will ever exhaust the King James Bible. And since that's the case, why would you waste your time collecting more Bibles, more translations on your bookshelf as though that were going to help? Comparing this guy's translation with that guy's translation will only lead you to confusion. It's like 25 people watching the same accident at an intersection and then the police taking 25 reports and they don't all square with each other. The brown car hit the blue uh, pickup truck. No, no, the blue pickup truck hit the brown car. He ran the red light. No, no, he ran the red light. Things like that happen all the time. And um, so I, I'm glad that God gave us one book that we can come to and trust it to be the perfect word of God from cover to cover. And without any need of change, any need of correction, any need of improvement, what it needs is for us to believe it. What it needs is for us to trust it and to trust God to reveal it to us. As I said in church hour, the same Holy Spirit that lives inside of you is the same one who inspired the writers of the book. And if he can't teach his book to you through patience and prayer, nobody else can teach it to you. So you better trust God to be your ultimate teacher. But verses 27 and 28, once again, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. What about those who are not looking for him? 
will he appear to them? Go back, if you will, to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25, and uh, let's read verses 1 through 5. Matthew 25, verses 1 through 5. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. There were some people there who weren't looking for the bridegroom. They weren't watching. Look later down, down at Matthew 25, beginning at verse 26. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gathered where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's somebody else that wasn't watching. He wasn't uh, diligent to be about the Father's business. Go to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. I hope I'm not irritating little Genesis back there. I know my voice can be irritating to some. I hope it's not irritating to her. Luke chapter 21. And uh, begin there with verse 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting, that's overabundance, and drunkenness, and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Not everyone... Um, let me say this, uh, not every Christian is looking for Christ to return, and they're not living with that expectation in mind from day to day. They should be, but the truth is they're not. They're caught up in the cares of this life, they're caught up in the issues of the day, the issues of the moment, and, uh, They don't think that Christ might come back today. Sometimes I'll go out of my house and uh, it's early in the morning and maybe I'm getting ready to go to work and look up in the sky and see how full of clouds it might be or it might be clear. And the thought comes to me, this could be the day that the saints hear Christ say, come up hither. Amen. And uh, after that, eventually Christ will come back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on the world that knows not God, that obeyed not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the clouds will part, and there'll be a, um, an indescribable invasion from outer space of the Lord Jesus Christ and glorified saints with him in an army like the world has never imagined before, to take over planet Earth, to lay waste the wicked of the world, to destroy the man of sin, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and to set up a kingdom that will run over the world, like, uh, run roughshod over the world without anyone at liberty to stand up with any objections. No one's going to be standing with a smart out response to Jesus Christ when he comes back. And I look up in the sky and think, what if that were to happen right now? Talk about your UFOs, right? Talk about your unexplained or unidentified flying objects and unexplained phenomenon. You say, well, those, those 
ideas. Those are all fanciful ideas, and that sounds like fairy tale more than anything else. You know, I was reading an article just the other day about um, objects visible to pilots, jet pilots, which were not detected by the ground radar. This has happened quite a bit. They'll report seeing something flying in their in the air, airspace near them, and it's not detected by any ground radar. How do you explain those things? And the radar detects the jet and the other uh, aircraft in the area, but something that defies description is oftentimes not recorded. Now, either the guy is just making it up because he wants to create a, a stir, a sensational story, uh, but then he'd probably be stripped of his pilot's license and be grounded for, you know, being half insane. So I don't think you'd jeopardize that. A lot of things that um, cannot be fully explained, but they are real nonetheless. I don't know how to explain electricity. I mean, electricians know how to, how to uh, use it, and utilize it, and know how to harness it and direct it, and direct current to wire a building and so forth. But what is it? How do you access it? How, do you, how is it generated? What, what causes it? It happens naturally, lightning. And uh, a lot of things that men may be able to control in some limited uh, way, but to fully explain it, I don't know if they can fully explain what it is. A lot of things like that. And uh, notice, I want you to notice, go to Hebrews chapter 12. Those Christians who are not looking for Christ to return, those Christians who are not living with that expectation in mind, is Christ going to appear to them? Look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. It says there, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Go back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, and I think it's uh, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If purity of heart, or holiness, is the prerequisite to see Christ, will he appear to those Christians who don't measure up? And the answer is this. He won't appear to them. They will not see him. Because the context of Hebrews 9.28 is not a New Testament church-age believer looking for the rapture. It's for someone in the tribulation looking for the second advent. Doesn't even apply to you. Doesn't even apply to a Christian. It pertains to the Jew looking for the return of his Messiah. The book of Daniel says that some who do know their God shall wax by and do exploits. And so not every Jew will be deceived by the Antichrist. Some will know that he's a deceiver. And of course they'll be hunted down, like all the other Jews are hunted down by the man of sin. The context had nothing to do with believers looking for Christ to come back in the rapture. But the context was uh, those looking for the advent, the second glorious coming of Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 28, He shall he appear the second time. Uh, lastly, the phrase in verse 28, the second time, without sin, unto salvation. That's defined right in the text, right in the verse. So Christ, so Christ was once offered to bear the sin, sins of many. He won't do that the next time. He won't bear anyone's sins for them. Uh, it's already been done. It was done at the uh, cross of Calvary. And uh, it doesn't need to be repeated. If it, as I said earlier, if it needed to be repeated, then his death wouldn't be of any more value than the animals which preceded it. This is what makes the Roman Catholic sacrifice in the Mass such a farce. They believe that they're re-sacrificing Jesus Christ once again. They call it the sacrifice of the Mass. Lord, accept the sacrifice at, uh, at they, they pray, the people pray, 
May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands, the priest, for the good of his church, and so forth. And the priest says, uh, we pray God will accept the sacrifice which we offer. They are anticipating uh, sacrificing Jesus once again in just a few minutes on their altar. Before <clears throat> the so-called uh, transubstantiation, the changing of the elements takes place, that wafer is called a host. It's called a host. It is a host uh, which will be inhabited by Jesus Christ. Like, a, like a, a body which is a host for some other parasite, for example. And I don't mean the negative connotation of Christ. But you get the definition, you understand the definition. It's called the host. And then once the priest says his magic formula, Hacus Corpus Meum, that was Latin for this is my body, um, which Americans made a joke out of and coined the phrase hocus pocus for magic tricks by a magician. Once the priest says that prayer of consecration and blessing um, and supposedly transforms the elements into the human flesh of Jesus and the wine into his human blood, it is now referred to as the Eucharist. It goes from being called the host to the Eucharist, which is supposed to mean... Uh, thanksgiving, the word thanksgiving. We're supposed to give thanks that has now been transformed into the human flesh of Jesus and into his human blood. And this is how a Catholic gets Christ in him, by eating Christ's flesh and drinking his blood. It's not a matter of faith. It's not a spiritual operation. It's not something by faith between the sinner and the Savior. It's a physical uh, practice of swallowing this bread, and if you're lucky enough, getting a sip of that wine, usually the priests save that for themselves. Uh, but, and, if there, and if there are excess wafers left over at the end of their church service, he takes those wafers and he puts them in this bronze, this brass container called the tabernacle, and under lock and key, so nobody can steal them. But somehow the wine always gets finished. That's by the priest. They don't lock the excess of that. They sometimes they make sure it's it's clean. And they it's wiped clean. Then he takes it, wipes it clean, makes sure they got every drop. If you ever watch a Catholic mass, you'll see that's what they do. But I was I went up to um, St. Joseph's in Upland years ago with a couple of friends of mine on a Sunday night. And they had never gone to the Catholic Church, but my buddy and I, we were talking about some of these subjects. They were saved, but they didn't know much about that church. And then I was learning, and we sat in the audience, and it was full house on Sunday night. And we just observed everything they did. And when we left, I told my friends, you know something? If Christ's death wasn't sufficient, all sufficient, the first time, it'll never be sufficient no matter how many times you do it. You do it 10,000 times and it still won't save you for eternity. And he grasped a hold of that concept. And uh, that's nevertheless the truth. If someone could grasp a hold of the idea that Christ is so infinite and so much greater than you and I, that his death one time on Calvary was sufficient for everyone. If they could just grasp a hold of that fact, then they could dispense with all this religious uh, nonsense, these religious customs and traditions, where only a guy in a special uh, set of vestments and clothes is qualified to do this, and make you think something's happening that's not happening. I work in, the, in my day job with a funeral home. I worked at a Catholic funeral yesterday, right here in town. And at the end of the, the funeral mass, the priest wants to swing the incense and the incense is supposed to represent the prayers of all the faithful. And he gets this incense shaker on a chain, and he walks around the casket, and the smoke, you know, surrounding the casket is supposed to represent all everyone's prayers on behalf of that loved one, ascending to heaven for their well-being and their eternity. But someone had forgot there's a little coal. They'll light that coal inside that brass um, sensor. And then the priest... Uh, as, a, as, a, as an action in front of the people because everything is made and designed so that the priest looks like he's doing something holy and spiritual. 
And um, evidently they had forgotten to light that coal before church started. So he's taking this powdered incense, sticking it on there, and no smoke is coming out. And um, he tries swinging it, and nothing's happening because there's no, there's no fire in there. So he and the two altar boys, all three of them in their little robes, they go running back to the back behind the, in the sacristy where the priest usually changes his clothes. Everybody's in the church wondering what's going on. They're waiting. There's some singers, they decided to keep singing the same song to fill time. About two or three minutes later, the priest comes back and someone lit it now. They got it working now. I thought, why worry about these stupid little customs? It affects absolutely nothing. It signifies nothing. It's just a bunch of theatrics. Every Catholic Mass starts at the back of the church by the back doors, the back pew. And it processes up the center aisle as the music is playing. That's the start of the Mass. And they in unison bow towards the altar or towards the crucifix on the wall, the priest and the altar servers, the helpers. Everybody goes to their station. And uh, then the song continues. The song's over. And uh, my brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. And uh, they say, and also with you. They've changed that even. The last couple of years, they changed that. And with your spirit. And, so, and they, they say, well, we want to make it more correct. It was, it was imprecise over those centuries. We want to go back to the most... Who cares? What, what does it signify? It doesn't signify a blessed thing. The force be with you. And also with you. It means just about as much. And um, you read that there are, there are markings in the missile. And it's not in the little missalette, the book, that the parishioners have in their pews. But there are markings, and not in all, but in some I've seen, uh, little little symbols, indicators in the text that the priest is reading to indicate when he's supposed to put his hands on his heart, when he's supposed to hold his hands out like this to pray, when he's supposed to make the sign of the cross. There are little prompts in there, like a like a script. It's a drama. It's a theatrical play. It's being acted out every day of the year. And uh, you'd think after a while people would grow uh, tired of the same routine. But there are the devout who think this is the substance of spirituality. And unfortunately, people who go through that kind of religion, and it might not be Catholicism, it might be the Anglican Church, the Church of England, which is just Catholic light. It might be the Lutheran Church, which is Catholic a little bit lighter. Uh, it might be Presbyterians. It might be uh, certain Methodist groups where they still think the minister has to have a special robe, special garments, and so forth our congregational minister, where everyone recites the same Lord's Prayer every Sunday. Um, it's not the Lord's Prayer. Christ never prayed it. He said, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. Not pray me, pray ye. And he didn't even say, repeat after me. He said, after this manner, therefore. It's a pattern. He didn't say, repeat after me. Ready, begin. No. And yet that's how they treat it. That's all they know. Uh, but it's a theatrical show. It's a drama. It's, it's a, a play being acted out. The, the only difference is that each church is a little bit different uh, theater. The priest's garments may vary from Sunday to Sunday. But the, basic, the format is basically the same. It all culminates at the end. The, the, the climax of the, of the drama is the wine of the wafer being changed into the body and blood of Christ. And everybody goes away thinking they've just received Christ in them. It's a farce. It's a joke. And that's why I said recently the Catholic Church is the oldest, the oldest cult in the world. You say, why do you pick on them? Because they've been at it a lot longer. And they've produced a lot more corruption. They've twisted the scriptures beyond recognition. And somebody comes out of that thing after years. They're empty. Their, their souls, their spiritual lives are still empty. They still don't know God. They have no comfort, no assurance of salvation, no sense of forgiveness of their sins. They're just as wicked when they leave church as they were when they entered. Nothing changes in them. And so they, they walk away saying, well, I tried Christianity, that didn't work. Maybe I'll try this. Maybe I'll try New Age religion. Maybe I'll try Hinduism. Maybe I'll try agnosticism. Maybe I'll try any number of things. Catholicism creates more agnostics than it saves. It creates more skepticism, more atheism than it um, undoes or rescues people from. For every person who foolishly joins a Catholic church saying, I used to be a skeptic and now I wanted some religion, you'll find 10 that were Catholics and became atheists. 
Catholicism is a joke. But the second time Christ comes back, he won't be coming back to bear anyone's sins. That was done on the cross of Calvary. It doesn't need to be repeated again. So he'll come back without sin unto salvation. He'll save the world from its own self. He'll save the world from the governments that they've created. He'll save the world from the laws that they've passed. He'll save the world from the false religions that they've substituted for a knowledge of God. He'll save the world from all of those things by his own enforced rule and righteousness. I'm looking forward to that day. I can't wait to come back with him in glorified form to be like him, to be with him, to reign over this world and, and whatever job he assigns me. And so should you. 